We are delighted to be joined by the excellent Nate Pickowitz. Welcome, Nate. Oh, thanks for having me on. We really enjoyed having you on uh, a couple of months ago when you recorded your testimony, so a lot of the listeners will be familiar with you. But for those that didn't hear, just tell us a little bit about yourself. Sure. I'm a pastor in Gilmanton Ironworks, New Hampshire, so over in the States. Um, I'm born and raised here. Uh, I've got a wife and two kids and uh, pastoring a church that we planted about seven years ago. And uh, so it's just been a, a good work so far. Um, like I said, I'm pastoring in the town I grew up in, so yeah. it's kind of a, a different experience, but it's been really good so far. Um, I do a little bit of writing. I've got a few books out. I do some articles and just try to keep it simple. So that's that's me in a 20-second nutshell. <laughs> that's really good. We were just talking offline before we started recording about your, your Twitter account and... Um, some of the listeners who, who do follow you, and if you don't follow Nate Pickowitz on Twitter, you know, why not? Nate is one of the best. <laughs> <laughs> Nate is so awesome on Twitter. Nate, just t- tell everyone what you've done with Rick Astley uh, a couple of months back. It was just excellent. Oh, my goodness. So uh, <laughs> if, if your listeners are familiar with Rick Rowling, so my wife didn't know what that was. I had to explain it to her. And by the time I was finished explaining, it wasn't even funny anymore. So, uh, But for those who know what it is, if you know what Rick Rowling is, uh, I went on to Twitter. It was a particularly uh, bad week. I get, every week's bad on Twitter. Everybody's mad about something all the time. That's but true. there was one week that yeah. was really bad. People were really upset, and it was just uh, toxic. And yeah. so I, I was thinking to myself, I got to do something to, to lighten this up or to yeah. have some fun or, you know, <laughs> I don't like to take it too seriously. So um, I went through with about 20 or 25 tweets. Yeah. And the, fir- the first word of every tweet going up my timeline was a rickroll, never going to give you up all the way up to the very last line. And, um, <laughs> and I just I, I put it out there. I was nervous <laughs> that someone was going to catch me while I was doing it. But nobody did, thankfully. So at the very end of it. I, I just told a few of my friends, you know, privately. I said, "Hey, check this out," you know, because otherwise, no one ever picks it up. And then, uh, yeah. within a within an hour or so, folks were talking about it and laughing and having fun, and it kind of just changed some stuff. I mean, it's just uh, you just can't take yourself too seriously no. on social media. It's just not worth it. It was so good. Tell tell me, you've got another one planned, Nate? Well, I I, I can't tell you that. <laughs> I, you know, I'm not going to expose my you know my secrets you know well we're going to be looking at every tweet now with a magnifying glass we're, we're on we're on your case now nate so be careful <laughs> yeah i'll drop some dairy and toms then right? <laughs> yeah <laughs> <laughs> so nate you've got a new book out john cotton uh, patriarch of new england how did you come to be involved with this project oh my goodness so for the last couple of years um i don't know how it happened i think i think it's one of those rabbit trails where i was researching the history of New England, because this is where I am. I mean, I, yeah. I pastor a church in New England. Uh, I'm curious about the history. I'm curious about uh, what what previous ministers did to to bring the Word of God, to revive the region, all those kinds of things. And so mm-hmm. for the last few years, I've been researching. And I've one of the first pastors that I bumped into uh, from history was John Cotton. And I, I had never heard of him before, but I, I read about him in... Um, Let's see. It was a book called uh, "Devoted: The Devoted Life," and yeah. it was a collection of biographical essays on various Puritans. Yeah. So I just started reading his stuff and reading his story, and I just fell in love with his testimony and his story and just who he is. And so I've been working with his stuff for a few years now, and and I bumped into this biography that was out of print. Nobody reads this one. Mm-hmm. There's a couple other academic biographies, but this one was was more pastoral and more for the Christian audience. And so I I grabbed it. Uh, made some edits to it, and then was able to reprint it just to get it back in circulation. So um, it's just a an opportunity to tell his story through the eyes of a pastor from 150 years ago and yeah. just try to get people more familiar with who John Cotton is. Yeah, so cool. You, you said that you're fascinated with the history of New England. In case any of your listeners aren't familiar with that, just give us a quick overview as to what that history is, Nate. Sure. So... Uh, we basically came from where you folks are, you know, a whole bunch of ships in the early 1600s came over mm. and uh, basically settled New England and planted colonies. And really that became, uh, I mean, there's, there were several colonies up and down the coast, but that really became a, a prominent uh, series of colonies that really sparked the, the foundation of the country. And so that was 1620 to 1640-ish. Mm. Uh, and then from there... You would just have, you know, 200 years of, of churches and ministers and gospel influence. The first and second Great Awakening uh, really got its root in New England. Uh, Jonathan Edwards was there. 
So, you know, you have this this incredible gospel influence and faithfulness and just uh, a region of space that's just alive uh, with, with Christianity and just faithful believers. And then somewhere like 100 years ago, things just begin to tank. Mm. And, uh, and so the spiritual climate just went down. Liberalism came through. Uh, people became uh, very self-reliant because of the economy was so good up here that all of a sudden, if you're making lots of money, people just don't seem to need God anymore, yeah. which is a fallacy. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so all these perfect storms really come together, and, uh, and New England just goes down. And now, I mean, by all statistical standards, we're an unreached people group. There's less than 2% professing believers in most parts of New England. Wow. Um, and so it's just very, very dry. But in truth, I mean, we're probably about 20 years behind parts of Ireland and parts of England. So. Yeah. You know, a lot of areas uh, where you guys are are really ahead of us, and I say ahead meaning farther along yeah. down, you know, the the spiral, if you will. Yeah. Um, but we're we're the future of uh, of areas in this country if things don't change and uh, and churches don't really bone up and start preaching the Bible. Mm. So uh, it's it's incredibly um, it's humbling to be here. Uh, there's you can't assume any level of cultural Christianity, but at the same time. I love being here. I love ministering here. I love these people. I love the challenge of it. Um, the conversations are different because you, nobody, when you talk to someone, it's not like they already know and they're just yeah. placating you. Yeah. Uh, they get to hear about Jesus and they get to hear the gospel and in a lot of cases for the first time. So really just a tremendous opportunity to minister and uh, I wouldn't be anywhere else in the world. I love it here. Mm. You, you grew up where you are now. I know you, you, you left for a while, didn't you, to go to seminary and how long was your way for and, and and how has it changed in your absence sure so when i was a kid i grew up a mile down the street from here so yeah. uh went to church as a kid here i have friends and family here and then i actually went off to school uh i went to a, a college uh, preparatory school when i was uh, 15 and that was relatively local then i went to pennsylvania if you're not mm. familiar with that it's about eight hours sort of south down by new york city okay. um so i was there for a couple of years and then bounced around uh, in southern New Hampshire, but really didn't come back to Gilmanton, my hometown, uh, till probably about uh, eight or nine years ago. So there was a gap of time, you know, probably uh, 15 or 18 years where I was away mm -hmm. uh, and um, have, have come back since. But I would say the, the things are actually looking up, I think. There are more churches in this area uh, that are preaching the gospel, more pastors that are committed to expository preaching, Great, wow. uh, more churches that are committed to sound doctrine. Um, that I think there's more more so now than when I was a, a child. Mm -hmm. um, I read one statistic that says that 30% uh, of all the churches in New England were planted within the last seven years, and I think that's true. Mm -hmm. So there's a, a large movement going on right now where people are seeing the need and they're bringing the gospel here, and ministers are stepping up and, and preaching the Bible. And I think the Christians up here are hungry for it, and so they're flocking to churches that are doing that, and it's just really encouraging to see. Yeah, definitely. Tell us about the Puritans then, um, Nate. Who are they, what are they, and, and what was their role in history? Oh, my goodness. You have a three-hour podcast? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, let's do it. Let's do it. No, uh, so uh, strictly speaking, uh, the Puritan movement was a, a movement from 1560 to about 1660 in mm. England. Mm. Uh, it's really important that we, we specify geographically where it is and the time period that it happens. And essentially what you have is you have the English Reformation that comes through in the early 1500s, but that really gets politicized and the church, the, the remnant, if you will, the church itself, really does is not comfortable uh, with the level of reformation that's been taking place. I mean, there's still a lot of Roman Catholic traditions, and there's lots of hierarchy that are taking place in the Church of England. Mm. And so a large movement of believers mm. really begin to work to labor and purify and further reform the church. And so at first, up until, you know, for that hundred-year period— uh, they were opposed, you know, because people in power don't want to give up power. I mean, yeah. the, the king wanted to be the head of the church, and we know that Jesus Christ is the head of the church. Yeah. And so it really was a reform movement, um, and it lasted for about that century. But uh, at a certain point, a lot of these Puritan ministers and Puritan believers began to be persecuted. And so as they're being persecuted, uh, they're fleeing the country. They're going to Geneva. They're going to Amsterdam. They're fleeing to New England. And so we see the, the tendrils of that movement spreading out. And really the heart of Puritanism 
is a devotion to the Word of God, a devotion to sound doctrine, a focus on holiness and uh, living a godly life. And so there are certain markers of Puritanism that, while it was specific to that time period, uh, the spirit of it really kind of propels forward. I mean, people like Jonathan Edwards are really regarded in a lot of circles as kind of like a Puritan, even though you lived outside that time. Yeah. Uh, and even to our day, I mean, J.I. Packer has been called sort of a, a Puritan remnant. Uh, so there's really a spirit of Puritanism that's that kind of focus. Uh, and then there's really the historical movement, which is that 100-year period in England. And so um, and it's valuable, I think, for us because any time you know, we, we seek – I would say revival, when we seek faithfulness, biblical faithfulness, we're really seeking the same things that the Puritans were seeking. And so yeah. their writings are so rich and so devotionally uh, uh, rich, and their theology is solid. Uh, we've learned so much just as uh, a, a church uh, history movement. We've learned so much from the Puritans. I mean, they were just tireless uh, defenders of the Bible and preachers of the Bible, and they were committed to godliness. And, and in some cases, they're their movement really fostered social reform. That's not the reason you do something, but it is a, a byproduct of faithfulness yeah. in some cases. And so there's just so much they have to offer, and uh, it's really inexhaustible, but really just a wonderful movement of time, and God did so much through that movement. That's so awesome. So your, your book's obviously about John Cotton. Let's laser focus in on him now, then. So where does John Cotton fit into this movement and all of that historical context you were just talking about? Right. So John Cotton is born in... Um, He's born in Derby, England in 1585, and he's born really into uh, sort of the, the second wave of Puritanism, as it were, if he's yeah. starting in 1560, kind of the, the next up-and-coming generation. Uh, he goes to Cambridge and studies under uh, William Perkins. Uh, he actually is not a believer at the time, and so Perkins preaches so con with such conviction that at first John Cotton doesn't want to hear him, and actually when Perkins dies, John Cotton uh, confessed later that he was rejoicing in his heart because he wouldn't be bothered by this yeah. minister anymore, which is crazy <laughs> yeah, to think. Yeah. Um, but then he comes under uh, the tutelage of uh, Richard Sibbs, and Sibbs really does a work on him, but in a, in a pastoral and in a godly way, and really ministers to him, and he converts to Christ. And then right after his conversion, he's studying uh, in, in school to become uh, some kind of a minister in the Church of England. And he actually switches his focus on preaching. He was used to the real uh, erudite, high and lofty, grandiose preaching. Mm -hmm. And he switches over to what's called the plain style, which is what we would say just expository preaching. You just take the text, you explain it, and you apply it. Yeah. Um, so he has this dramatic conversion, not just to Jesus, but also to a new style of preaching. And from that point becomes a preeminent preacher, one of the greatest preachers in England at the time, uh, pastors a church in Boston, Lincolnshire, uh, St. Baltolf's Church, and pastors there for 20 years until finally he's driven out, makes his way across the Atlantic, and settles in Boston, another Boston, mm. Boston, Massachusetts, yeah. and pastors there for the next uh, 20 years. Uh, he writes extensively over 40 works on church government and uh, theology and is incredibly influential, but yet hardly anybody knows who he is. But he's right up there. He influences uh, Thomas Goodwin. He influences John Owen. So just a titan of Puritanism, uh, a godly man, a faithful pastor, and just a uh, just an inspiration. Yeah, wow. You mentioned that he, he published over 40 pieces of work. W what have we got left of, of those bits of work? Have we, have we got access to all of them? Do we, do we know what they all are? So we, we actually do. Um, when I say that, they're, they're not published, so it's kind of strange because there are other Puritans where their entire works at least have been published somewhere in time. Yeah. The complete works of John Cotton have never been published. Um, I'm really hoping and, and praying that this comes to fruition at some point in the future, but we do have lists of what he did, and uh, there are manuscripts floating around. For, for right now, there's a, a fellow named Digby James, Dr. Digby James. He's actually spent the last 30 years going through old libraries and not only finding these works but transposing them and typing them by hand so oh, he wow. has t retyped yeah. the complete works of john cotton and they're on his website on quinta press so you can actually go on quinta press and read everything john cotton's ever written it's pretty remarkable oh wow okay great he was in involved with a project milk for babes as well wasn't he and that that ended up having a massive impact didn't it for years after his death that's right that's right yeah very good you've done your research that's good yeah, yeah he wrote a catechism <laughs> when he was in america called milk yeah. for babes and it was just a very simple uh, child's uh, catechism but uh, but it was so influential they used it 
uh, just as standard literature for all students in America for 150 years. Mm. So I went through several printings. So any child that was catechized in America for the first century and a half was using John Cotton's catechism. Yeah, wow. So, yeah. I mean, his, his fingerprints are on everything, everywhere over here. It's just amazing. How, how does the process work in terms of you get this old manuscript? How do you begin the process of reworking it and editing it and getting it into a, a modern um, you know, language that we can actually understand and digest today? Yeah, so it depends on the work that you're using. So if I'm using, so I've, I've re- reprinted a couple other books as well. I, yeah. I reprinted um, John Cotton's Christ the Fountain of Life. That's going to be coming out again, actually, a new edition of that uh, in a few months. But, you know, I start by just taking the raw text. Um, sometimes it's tricky to get that. Mm. Sometimes you can take a, a PDF file and you can you can drag your cursor across and actually copy and paste the raw text. Other times you have to type it out by hand. So I've typed whole books out by hand just by sight. Um, but usually I just get the raw text. And then you just have to start formatting and just trying to read it and make sense of it, understand what the text is, and then you just have to kind of format it in a way that's readable. Uh, and then I usually go through and I modernize, so the V's and the thou's, I change those. Not everybody likes when you do that, but yeah. I, I prefer to do that. Um, and I just, my method, it's really not as much of a science as it is, I think, more of an art form, but I just try to get into the writer's mind and say, okay, if John Cotton were alive in 2019, is this what he would say? How would he say it? And would he be happy with the things that yeah. I'm doing with his book? Yeah. So I just try to get into their brain. What are they trying to say? And sometimes you change punctuation, you change spelling. Sometimes I've reordered certain sentences uh, just to try to capture the thought as best as possible. Because sometimes you know you bridge a 400 year gap, and you're yeah. going to have some challenges in yeah. some cases with just articulating so i just try to get the the work as readable as possible but as faithful to their their voices as, as much as i can uh, i don't um modernize to the point where i'm you know changing their words and changing you know all of their sentences it's not a uh, it's not a, a an, an annotated or a uh, yeah. what do you want to call it a, a heavily yeah, modernized yeah, yeah, yeah. or a yeah. reimagining yeah. it's not a yeah. reimagining yeah um I, I really try to keep their voice as much as possible and and then once I have the, the document to a place where it feels like I can read it and it's comfortable, then I send that in, and, and then you format it and put it in a print. So uh, it's really just trying to sit with the work and try to understand the arguments and the flow of thought and and just try to do honor yeah. uh, to the work they've done. I, I, I would never want John Cotton to come back from the grave if that was even possible, mm-hmm. but to come back and read mm-hmm. this book and say, that's not what I said. Yeah, you know, yeah, So sure. you just want to be faithful to the, to the work itself and, and just try to really uh, present this to a modern audience in a way that they can understand. Yeah, that's fascinating. As you were going through the works, did you come up against anything that you didn't agree with? Oh, all the time. I mean, <laughs> I mean, it's, uh, I mean, I'm reformed in my theology, so all these Puritans, uh, for the most part, we're all reformed in their theology. But, yeah. you know, I mean, I'm not Presbyterian, I'm, I'm Baptistic, and so, you know, when they have all these treatises about uh, justifying infant baptism, I, I don't agree, you know, yeah. I mean, that's just, that's how I understand uh, the Bible from my perspective. But at the same time, I think you can look at something like that, or even their eschatology. Most of them are post-millennial. Uh, Cotton Mather was actually pre-millennial. He didn't know what that was yet, but yeah. he, that's what his theology was. Um, but, you know, you, you read the work, and I think the, the way to move forward with that is just to say, look, I want to understand how their argumentation works. And, you know, if they're advocating for, you know, infant baptism, for example, um, I want to understand, is, is this a, a, a good argumentation? Is this is this a fair treatment of the text? And and there's a way to appreciate what they're writing and what they're presenting, even if you don't agree with it. Yeah. Um, I think the same thing goes with eschatological yeah. views or whatever. But by and large, the Puritans, uh, their theology is very, very solid. Their view of the Bible is correct. Their view of God, mm-hmm. justification, the doctrine of Christ. I mean, all these things are so good. And um, and so it's it's very hard to nitpick, I think, yeah. uh, especially if that's your theological pedigree. Yeah. How important is it for Christians to know their church history today, Nate? Well, it's been said that if you don't know your history, you're doomed to repeat it. So I think for Christians, uh, it's incredibly important to know the kinds of uh, theological and, and societal battles that they fought. Mm. Uh, I think, you know, whenever you have a person who gives their life for gospel ministry, I mean, they're they're doing that, hoping and praying that the fruit or the work that they do will bear fruit. 
and that their children and grandchildren aren't going to forget the things that they worked so hard to accomplish. And so um, certainly we do this for the glory of God alone, yeah. but the byproduct of that is that I don't, I don't want uh, to make the mistakes that my spiritual forefathers were, were working hard to guard against, and so I don't want to go backwards. And so um, you know, when you look at the battles that they're fighting, when you look at what they're up against, uh, it's really important. Uh, if, just for example, you go to uh, even the early church, and you know the formulation of how we understand the doctrine of um, of, of the Trinity or the hypostatic union. Yeah. I mean, if we don't have that, then we're we have heresy. You yeah. know, so we yeah. we have to know those things, and it actually helps us to fight some of the theological and ecclesiastical battles that we deal with today. You know, if we know how the church and the history has done it and what some wisdom that they can offer us, we would be better for it. I mean, there is a Bible says there's one spirit, you know, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, the same spirit of God who is working and, and helping Christians to, to fight and contend for truth back then is the same spirit who is helping us to contend now. So yeah, yeah. Uh, we would do well to know our history for sure. As a pastor, what, what, what do you do to actively teach your church and, and how do you go about doing that? Uh, we're still kind of working through that. I think uh, I think our church is starting to catch on with some of the work I do. Um, I, I turn out so many things. Some of them are very uh, – I, I just put them out, and they just kind of disappear. <laughs> uh, I put out about 12 titles in three years, and most of them don't really get much publicity. So I'm always editing. I'm always releasing something. Um, so I don't know if they're always caught up with what I'm doing, but I try to just tell them what I'm working on. Um, and, and just try to let them know what it is. And I encourage them to read as much as possible. But just for example, in 2017, I taught through a series on the five solos at our church, and that became the book Why We're Protestant. And so that was helpful, I think, uh, to them and just really trying to solidify their understanding of uh, not just the doctrines uh, of the Reformation, uh, but also understanding uh, you know church history itself. And so um, I don't really, uh, I'm not strong arming it. I don't push really hard to do that, but yeah. I, I do try to teach as much as possible and to be helpful in that regard. Yeah, that's good. What do you see in our generation of preaching or writing today that may still be being spoken about in 400 years' time? Oh, my goodness. So like, so the question is who who or what is being written now that's still going to be there? Yeah. Yeah. In, in the years to come. Yeah. Oh, boy. That's going to be hard, but I can't I can't see that people won't be reading Sinclair Ferguson 400 years from now. Um, I think people will still be uh, blessed by and uh, fond of the ministries of people like John MacArthur and R.C. Yeah. Sproul. Yeah. Um, you know, I think anybody who holds to sound doctrine, I think, you know, a ministry that that clings to doctrine doesn't try to get crazy and outside the bounds mm. really and i say this in the most loving way plain ordinary gospel ministry mm. biblically faithful gospel ministry uh will bear fruit i believe that mm. and uh you know even if if pastors uh don't have a, a big name or a big following and most people most pastors won't yeah. Um, you know, there's always knuckle brains like me who go and find, <laughs> dig up old manuscripts of people that no one's ever heard of and, and brings them back out because it's profitable and yeah. it's good. So yeah. I think I think any work that a minister does today um, that is faithful to the text and faithful to the Lord uh, will bear fruit in the future. But there, there's a few I think we'll, st we'll still be reading uh, in the age to come unless the Lord returns. So. Yeah, that's really interesting. If Nate Pickowitz is still being remembered in 400 years' time, what would you want that to be for? Night. Oh my goodness, brother! What are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, faithfulness. Yeah, uh, that that's all I want. I, you know, if if for some strange reason uh, somebody remembers me in four hundred years, uh, if they just remembered me as being faithful as a preacher, faithful as a student of Scripture, uh, that's what else can you want? Yeah. What else? Yeah. What else is there? Yeah. You know. So, I just you know I. I want to love my wife, love my children, pastor the church well, be as faithful to the text and to the Lord as possible, mm. and uh, I mean, that's it. I mean, there's there's nothing there's nothing earth shaking I'm probably going to do in this yeah. life. So yeah. just faithfulness. That's brilliant. If you could interview John Cotton today, what would you ask him? Oh my goodness, these are good questions, brother. My goodness, <laughs> uh, I would ask him. I would ask him how. So the story of John Cotton, when he was 
when he was in Boston, Lincolnshire, and he was ministering, all of his friends were being thrown in prison and cast out. He found a way to stay in the pulpit and stay faithful. So I'd, I would ask him questions about faithfulness. How, how do you minister to two churches for 20 years each? How do you pack up your family? What kind of faith and what kind of devotion do you have? And yeah. I would just sit at his feet and listen to his wisdom. Yeah. You know, how do you do this? You know, how do you stay faithful for decades? Yeah. Um, and that's any minister. I think any minister that's faithful for decades, I mm. want to know what they're doing. I want to know how to, to finish well. Mm. Um, I mean, he had trials. He had controversy in his ministry. There were things that, uh, that he was part of and things he did and decisions he regretted. And, you know, no one's perfect. And there are certain people out there who really don't like John Cotton at all and, mm. and really despise some of the work he did. But, mm. you know, when, it, when push comes to shove, he was faithful to the Lord to the end. And yeah. so... I would ask him questions about that. Um, I would ask him questions about uh, endurance. He lost uh, a wife along the way. I mean, he, he lost people. He had heartbreak. Mm -hmm. So just real simple questions about faithfulness, I think. Mm -hmm. Brilliant. Now, you mentioned before that you're a really busy man, and I know you've always got lots of projects going on. What's going to be next from you? What, what are we going to see on a, you know, in a bookshop next, and what are we going to see published next, and what are you working on now? Sure. So there's a few things that are going on that I'm, I'm really excited about. So uh, the first thing I'm doing is a series of reprints for H&E Publishing. So uh, we're going to be putting out uh, what's called the American Puritan series. And so we're going to be working through all these older books from New England, and we're going to try to get those into print. So that's mm -hmm. going to be a, a reprint series. It's hopefully going to launch sometime this fall. Yeah. Uh, alongside that, with a different publisher, so Reformation Heritage, is Lord willing going to be printing a book that Dustin Benj and I are writing called The American Puritans. And so yeah, we're going to so uh, survey a, a series of biographical sketches of a lot of these key leaders. And so uh, we're actually turning that manuscript in within the next two weeks. That's just about finished. Wow. And so yeah. uh, that's going to be looking forward to be coming out uh, probably next summer. Yeah. Um, and then I'm going to be writing a book on Bible study uh, that hopefully will be out, if not next year, the year to come. So uh, just books on scripture, books on the Puritans, and uh, just real simple blocking and tackling basics, uh, but just hopefully um, works that are going to be inspiring and helpful and edifying for the church. Brilliant. Nate, that's half an hour done. I've, I've so enjoyed our time together. You're going to have to come on again when your next book comes out and we have to talk about it. Oh, I'd love to. That'd be great. Nate, thank you so much for your time. Nate, just give us your Twitter handle before you go. I'll also put it in the description below as well so people can get in touch with you. Sure. It's at Nate Pickowitz. That's it. Nice and easy. Brilliant. Okay, lovely. Nate, thank you so much for your time, brother. Have a good day there.